Hello, I'm Matt Galloway, and this is The Current Podcast. It was one of the most anticipated U.S. Supreme Court rulings in years. Former President Donald Trump and his lawyers had gone to the highest court in the country to argue that he should get blanket immunity from prosecution for anything he did while in office. On Monday, six out of nine justices ruled that presidents are entitled to immunity with some limits. Republican Speaker of the House Mike Johnson had nothing but praise for the decision. You have to have the president with the ability to make difficult decisions hourly, daily, and not be worried about rogue prosecutors going after them at some point in the future. I mean, the the president can't operate if he has that kind of sort of Damocles hanging over his head. And that's very simply what the court ruled today. It should have been nine to zero. It was only six to three. Those three justices who dissented included Sonia Sotomayor, who warned that the decision was a threat to democracy and said, quote, the president is now a king before the law. Eric Siegel is the Ash Family Chair Professor of Law at Georgia State University and the author of two books on the U.S. Supreme Court. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. What exactly did the court say about when a former president is immune from prosecution? Well, there are two levels of this. On one level, the court created three buckets, and that kind of makes sense. The court said that when the president exercises constitutional powers given to him by the Constitution's text, he's commander in chief. He has a pardon power. When he does that, he's completely immune. When he exercises powers given to him by Congress, there's a presumptive belief of immunity but that has to be litigated. When he, when he engages in personal, non-official acts, he has no immunity at all, which makes sense. If he's you know, driving drunk to a party on personal time, he wouldn't have any immunity. I don't have a big issue with those three boxes, but what the court did after that is what is so devastating and, frankly, makes this opinion kind of like the hurricane barrel of constitutional law. So tell, us, really a, a, tell, tell, really, tell us about that. So the court made two side decisions. It said that evidence of motive or state of mind of the president cannot be admitted to show that he was committing an unofficial act. And the court said when he does official acts, that is not allowed to be admitted into evidence to shed light on whether the act in question is unofficial. What that means is that prosecutors somehow have to prove in the Trump cases in Georgia and in D.C., that he violated the law, he committed a criminal act without being able to introduce any evidence of motive. That's irrational. It's inconsistent with the text, history, and tradition of the United States. And it does, to all intensive purposes, make the president immune from pretty much all criminal liability. You you describe the decision as extreme. I I wonder if you could anchor it in an example, like a practical, in practical terms. Sure. Give us a scenario that explains how this could play out. I will, and this sounds crazy, okay? But it's what the court. <laughs> but it's what the court said. Uh, the president of the United States and the Attorney General of the United States are walking down Fifth Avenue, and they say to each other, "You know that guy Siegel, that law professor in Georgia? He's a pain, and he's a national security threat, and we think he's a danger to the United States of America. Under my powers as Commander in Chief, maybe I should execute him before he does something terrible." The Attorney General says, "Well, let me think about that for a minute," um, and then they see me on Fifth Avenue and they shoot me in cold blood. That conversation between the president and the attorney general is not admissible into evidence. So if the president was prosecuted for the murder of Eric Siegel, the evidence of what happened before that, the planning of it, the reason for it, none of that comes in. And the president says, I was looking out as commander in chief for the national security of America. Now, listen, under the court's reasoning, he would have immunity. (laughs) Now, you and I know as a political prediction that if that case got to the Supreme Court, they would find him guilty of killing me in cold blood. But that isn't the point. The point is this is about Donald J. Trump. This isn't about anything else. And the court wrote this decision very carefully to make those prosecutions extremely difficult. And and I hate to say this to your country and my country because I was born in Montreal, Mm -hmm. but it is true. What this court cares about is the Republican Party, and what this court cares about is Donald J. Trump. So that and they wrote the decision that way. So that is now crystal clear. But y- you're not the only one coming up with hypothetical scenarios. Justice Sotomayor <laughs> also gave some hypothetical situations in her dissenting opinion, saying, for example, that a president would theoretically be immune if he or she orders the Navy SEALs to assassinate not not that someone like you, but a political rival. <laughs> 
M- yes. Many Republicans have said that her reaction is, quote, hysterical, a gross overreaction to the implications of this ruling. What do you say? It is not. It falls extremely logically from the opinion. But this goes to a different issue about the Supreme Court. It very rarely follows the logic of its opinion opinions if there were reasons not to. And a good example of that is just just a couple of days before the Trump case, the court decided a big Second Amendment gun case in America that was really inconsistent with a case it decided two years ago. Uh, and that's a good thing because that prior case was really terrible. But the court is not living with the logic of that decision. Uh, and now in some ways, that's good. I think it's good when judges say, you know, we made a mistake. We're going to make up for it. The right. problem is the problem is the court does this not when the law is bad or the the, the court does this when politically it wants to change its mind. Okay. And that's a big problem. So, of course, the implications of this are, are huge, specifically where Donald Trump is concerned. The Manhattan District Attorney has already announced that Trump's sentencing in the, in the hush money criminal trial in New York will now be delayed. How do you think this ruling uh, will affect specifically, especially the case concerning the accusation that he was attempting to subvert the 2020 election results? And there are two cases about that, one in D.C. and one in Georgia. So let's take the Georgia case because that's the easiest. So he calls the secretary of state of Georgia and says, find me one more vote that I need to win. That coercion, that pressure, whether it's illegal or not, is clearly inappropriate. And it's part of a scheme of illegality, according to the prosecution. However, he's going to say, I was faithfully executing the election laws. Now, prior to this case, um, prior to this case, the prosecution then could have come back and said, no, you were not faithfully executing the election laws. You were trying to steal an election, and here's the evidence. But that evidence now may not be admissible. <laughs> so those two cases, especially the D.C. case, are in dire jeopardy, and I'm not sure they're going to be able to go forward, which is, of course, what the conservative Republicans on the Supreme Court want to happen. Right. So you've written two books about the Supreme Court, and you've been arguing for many years, long before Trump gained power, that the Supreme Court is flawed and has too much power. How how would you change that? So, so let me just say that that's correct. And I, I'm just, I've, I've come off kind of partisan in this conversation, but I am a nonpartisan critic of the court. Okay. I am pro-choice. I think Roe and Casey were wrong. I'm pro-choice all the way down. I think those are wrong cases. Um, th- it's very easy to explain. America has done something no country in human history has done it, in a free country, in a democracy. It has taken nine members of the public and said, you're a committee of, of smart people, wise people. You get to veto laws and you have unreviewable power for life. It's that last part. Mm. They have unreviewable power for life. In a democracy, we shouldn't do that. You guys don't do that. <laughs> Nobody does. Nobody does that. Um, so when a human being is given, if you get four of the votes, unreviewable power for life, it changes their character. And in my lifetime, the one justice who recognized that was David Souter, who retired very early because he recognized this is a job description that's inappropriate. Mm -hmm. And America has to reform the court. It just has to reform the court. One last thing. Thomas Jefferson in 1801 convinced the Congress of 1801 to, to, to terminate the court's term for a year. This has been going on since the beginning of our country, this this controversy about the court. Franklin Delano Roosevelt went on the radio in 1937 yeah. and said we have to save the country from the court. Um, so this is not new, and it needs to be changed. Eric Siegel, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you. Eric Siegel is the Ash Family Chair Professor of Law at Georgia State University and the author of two books on the U.S. Supreme Court.